Well, hello and welcome back to our Bible study coming to you on behalf of the Campbellsville Baptist Church here in Campbellsville, Kentucky. We are located at 420 North Central Avenue and we would love to have you come visit our church. Our Sunday school, our connection groups on Sunday morning are at 9.15 a.m. and after uh, those classes meet, we have morning worship uh, at uh, 10.30 a.m. On Wednesday evenings at uh, 6 o'clock, we have prayer meeting and Bible studies for you to partake of. And we would love to have you come and uh, we'd like to get to know you and help you uh, in any way that we can, help you with your walk with the Lord. And, and we would be thrilled just to get the opportunity to meet you and to get to know you. Uh, I, so I issue that invitation to you, uh, not only on my behalf, but also on the behalf of my pastor, Dr. Dwayne Norman, he too would love to, to meet you and, and see you. I am so glad that you have uh, decided to uh, look online today. Uh, we have been going through a study of Jesus Christ. And, uh, when, uh, and, and I've learned so much uh, from, uh, from these studies, and uh, I hope that you have too. Uh, we have been looking at the atonement of Jesus Christ, a vitally important topic to consider nowadays, given all of the attacks against it. And uh, we want, wanted to be sure to present a biblical picture of the atonement. And after having done that, we looked at the extent of the, the atonement, and we looked at two basic views on the extent of the, the atonement. First of all, what is known as limited atonement, or it's sometimes called particular redemption, that means that Christ died only for the elect, only for those that God chose before the foundation of the world. We also looked at unlimited atonement, sometimes it's called unlimited redemption, in other words, uh, that view says that the extent of the atonement was that Christ Jesus died for everyone, but only those who uh, place their faith in Christ, who make a faith commitment, they only those who believe will be saved. Not everybody will say, but only those who believe. And we said there's no sense in getting worked up about it, really, because the end result's the same. No matter which view that you take, neither view is uh, unorthodox. It's a difference of interpretation of the scriptures. So we looked at where the differences lie and where the support uh, lied. And so we, uh, we looked at that, and then we, um, we came to the conclusion uh, which is what we're going to talk about here in a moment. We came, well, I'm coming to a conclusion that I'll relay to you uh, on uh, on that. So um, after having said all that, let's pray and we'll get started. Father, thank you for the privilege of study and thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ. We've learned lots about him during this uh, study. And I pray, Father, that you continue to help us learn more about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and Lord, the, we, we really do want to be like him in every way, and we certainly want to honor him with our lives. And so we ask today that you would guide our study in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, just a summary of uh, the extent of the, atonement, uh, of the atonement. After all that we looked at, it seems to me uh, that it's fairly clear from the, all the various passages we looked at, and you can look at last week's video uh, if you'd like to see those. It seems to me that it's fairly clear from these passages and others, which we might refer to, that the Bible teaches that Jesus Christ died for all people, for all men. And therefore, all people are savable. All people are savable. All people potentially can be saved, but only those who appropriate the death of Christ by faith, by belief, will actually realize the salvation. And so thus I think that the analogy of the polio vaccine that we went over is more applicable here than is the analogy of the law court and the double jeopardy uh, argument. We need to remember that we do not prove doctrine. I mean, both sides have used analogies, but remember that we do not prove doctrine. We do not formulate doctrine by analogies or by examples or by types or even by parables. They may illustrate 
doctrine, but they do not formulate doctrine. And therefore, we formulate illustrations and analogies to illustrate a doctrine that we already find, find taught in the Scripture, that we own, already find taught uh, in the biblical text. We do not formulate an analogy and then use that to bolster uh, our doctrine. We do not impose our theology upon the biblical text, uh, what I call theologize the text. We don't do that. So, and I feel that's what's been done, perhaps, in the case of uh, limited atonement. And so, therefore, um, from what I can tell, it seems to me that the Scripture teaches that Christ Jesus died for all people, unlimited atonement, but only those who appropriate his death by faith will be saved. So now we want to move on, uh, as we still consider the death of Christ, and this is an extremely important section. We've been talking about appropriating the death of Christ into our lives. And so now we want to turn to the terms of salvation. The terms of salvation. In other words, how does one appropriate the benefits of Christ's death? We've already seen that Christ's death is available. The benefits are available to all people. That's the doctrine of unlimited atonement. But now the very crucial question arises, how does one appropriate these benefits? Or to state the question a, little, question a little differently still, what must a person do to be saved? Now you would think that Christians would be very clear, very clear, very precise, very specific at this point, but strangely enough, they are not. And this arises, I think, from a lack of biblical understanding. So let me illustrate the problem with some of the passages uh, here, um, here in a moment. Let me just say this. Uh, no one saves themselves. I mean, every, both sides believe that. Both sides of the views of the atonement believe that. No one saves themselves. But there must be some sort of faith response uh, that is very clear in Scripture. Paul said in Ephesians 2.8, For by grace you, you've been saved through faith, by means of faith, in other words. That's the means by which we appropriate grace into our life, through faith. Uh, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God and not of works, uh, or else we'd boast about it. So, uh, but what must a person do to be saved? Uh, there's a lack of biblical understanding on this topic. I illustrate from some passages. In Acts chapter 16 and verse 31, Paul and Silas respond to the question. They reply to the question of the Philippian jailer who said, What must I do to be saved? And they said, uh, Paul and Silas said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. So you may uh, think, Well, there you go. There's the answer to your question. Believe. But wait. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, the Apostle Peter is responding to the crowd on the day of Pentecost, and they say essentially the same thing. Men and brethren, what shall we do? What must we do? And Peter said, Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So there, there's another, some more terminology. Repent and be baptized, Paul said. Uh, believe. Peter said, repent, be baptized. Uh, Paul said, believe. Peter said, repent and be baptized. So how do we reconcile these two texts? But that's not the end yet. In Romans chapter 10, and verses 9 and 10, Paul said, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, in other words, Jesus as Lord, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. And so now we have another term added, confess. Believe here is the same as Acts 16.31, but in addition to believe, now we have repent, be baptized, and confess. Romans 10.13, just move down the page a little bit in your Bibles. Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So here you have something else still, uh, to call on the name of the Lord. Or a little bit further over in Romans chapter 15 and verse 12. In his name shall the Gentiles trust. 
or perhaps more literally, in him shall the Gentiles hope. So now you have trust or hope in the Lord added to call and confess and believe and repent and be baptized. But even that is not the end. Um, because in the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28, in verses 19 and 20, we're told that a person has to become a disciple. Go and make disciples. That's literally what uh, um, uh, teach means there. Go and make disciples of the nations. Well, what is, an, what is a disciple? A disciple is literally a learner or a follower, one who comes after a teacher, a leader, and follows him and believes in him and acknowledges him as authority. In Luke chapter 9 and verse 61, you might remember that uh, this young man uh, there said, uh, I will follow you, follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and bid farewell to them at my house. So becoming a follower or a disciple seems to be a condition for salvation. Or then again, you have Matthew 16, 24. Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Let him take up his cross and follow me. So now you have something else here too. To become a follower, you have to deny yourself in that verse. You have to take up your cross. And, and then if that were not enough, in Acts chapter 3 and verse 19, you have the words, repent and be converted. And we've already seen repent, but this is the first time that we have seen be converted. So here you have it. What must a person do to be saved? What are the terms of salvation, in other words? Well, if you put all these passage, passages together, we have believe, repent, be baptized, confess, call on the Lord, trust or hope in the Lord, become a disciple or follower, uh, deny yourself, take up your cross, and be converted. Now, I suppose that to the superficial reader of Scripture, this might be a little bit confusing. Are all of these things one and the same? Are they all totally distinct and discreet? Are these a dozen different things that need to be done? If so, in what order? In what sequence? How do we sort all of this out? Well, let's try to approach this in some sort of a logical fashion. Let's begin by considering the relation of repentance to faith or belief. What is the relationship of believing in Jesus Christ and repenting? These are prominent words in these passages that we have just mentioned. Now, I think that there's a great deal of misunderstanding here amongst Christians. Uh, first of all, we need to point out that there are two Greek words in the New Testament which are translated repent in our common English versions. One of these is the Greek verb metanaeo, and the other is the Greek verb metamelamai. Both of them, unfortunately, are translated repent, in our English translations, and many of our King, in many of our English translations, including the King James, uh, you, you find this, but they those two words do not mean exactly the same thing. Metanaeo, the first one, means to change the mind and the attitude. Metamelamai means to regret or to feel sorry. So if you want to see what approaches uh, perhaps total confusion, let me direct your attention to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. If you have the King James in particular, I wish you'd look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7, starting in verse 8. Paul says, For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent, though I did repent, for I perceive that the same epistle has made you sorry, though it were but for a season. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. For you were made sorry after a godly manner, that you might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow works repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world works death. Now, in all candor, uh, if you could look at that for the first time and make some sense out of it, 
you are indeed an exceptional, uh, an exceptional and perhaps an unusual person. The problem here in the, that verse, those verses, is that you have both of these Greek verbs mixed together and both of them translated the same way, namely repent. So let me straighten this out for you uh, and show you how nicely this comes out when you differentiate between these two words. Paul says in verse 8, For though I made you sorry with a letter, I don't regret it, although originally I did regret it, for I was afraid maybe I was a little bit too harsh. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed unto a change of mind. For you were made sorry after a godly manner. And now verse 10. For godly sorrow brings about a change of mind unto salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world works death. So now here you have it. Here you have it. Uh, with uh, the way I uh, translated uh, that. Uh, metamelami, godly sorrow, can be used to produce metanoia, uh, metanoia, uh, in other words, a changing of the mind. But they are not one and the same. Now, in the salvation passages of the New Testament, we have metanoia exclusively, we never have metamelami, therefore, when repent is used in a salvation context, when it's used in a salvation context, metamelami, not metamelami, but metanaeo, it always refers to a change of mind, a change of attitude, a redirection of one's thinking and one's attitudes. It does not refer to sorrow. So it's important that you understand that. Let me say it once more. When repent is used in the New Testament in salvation passages, it always, without exception, refers to a change of mind and a change of attitude. It does not refer to sorrow or sadness or regret. Now look at some of the passages involved. In Mark chapter 1 and verse 15, Jesus said, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. In other words, change your mind. Change your attitude. Realize that the kingdom of God is now at hand. Realize that the Messiah of Israel is here. Change your whole outlook. Change your whole way of looking at things because the kingdom of God is here. Or look at Acts chapter 3 and verse 19. Peter says, Repent therefore and be converted. Change your mind. Look at things from a different standpoint, in other words. Turn away from your old ways and your old thought patterns and look at it from God's standpoint. Stop looking at Jesus of Nazareth as though he were just a man, just a teacher, or just a great example, or just a great prophet. You're going to have to start looking at him in a different manner altogether. He is the Son of God. He is the Savior of the world. Or the passage that we just looked here, uh, at here uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10, again, Godly sorrow produces a change of mind unto salvation. Now that shows that godly sorrow may indeed play a part in salvation. It may prompt one to change one's mind. And I'm no wise saying that if you shed tears when you were saved, that there was anything wrong with that, nor that I'm saying it wasn't a valuable part of your experience. It doesn't always happen to everyone. But if you shed tears and this led you to a change of mind concerning Christ and God and a change of mind concerning spiritual things, then that's just wonderful. And that's what Paul says here, that godly sorrow can produce repentance. It can produce a change of mind. But the sorrow itself is not the change of mind. You see, we have to be very careful here, um, or we lapse into the Roman Catholic doctrine of penance, and that is incidentally the way that uh, the uh, duet, Dewey vision, uh, version rather, the duet vision, the old uh, duet uh, vision of the Roman Catholic Bible translates, translates this, do penance, it says, if you want to be saved, and this, of course, gives rise to every conceivable 
kind of works type of salvation. You have to work up a sorrow for your sins. You have to light candles. You have to make restitution. You have to do certain good works in the church or in the community and so on. All of this, you see, is not salvation by grace through faith. This is salvation by penance. And uh, we must be careful that we don't make repentance something of a sorrow or a regret, which borders on this. Perhaps some of you have seen pilgrims at the great cathedral in Mexico City climbing up the stairs on their knees uh, in order that by their bloody knees they might demonstrate to God how sorry they are for their sins. That's penance. So let's be careful that we don't make repentance something like that, that you have to be sorry for your sins to be saved. You know, the Bible never actually says that. You may very well be sorry for your sins. You probably are. I know that I was and am. But that isn't what saves you. That would be salvation by works. What you have to do is change your mind about your old life and redirect your thinking, that kind of repentance, and your attitude and your whole life pattern towards Jesus Christ. That change of mind leads to uh, a, a holy change in our lives because we're no longer following our old ways. We've done a 180 degree about face because we've changed our mind and we believe now on the Lord Jesus Christ. Our whole lifestyle changes because we no longer live according to the old man anymore. We live according to the fact that we are a new creation in Christ after having repented. Well, in Hebrews chapter 12, I think that uh, we have brought this out very clearly in the case of uh, Esau. Uh, in verses 16 and 17, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know how that afterwards, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, no place for a change of mind, in other words, though he sought it carefully with tears. So that's very important, those uh, two verses, verses 16 and 17 of Hebrews chapter 12. The word of God says he never repented. He was sorry. He even wept in sorrow, we know from the text, but he never found a place for a genuine change of mind, which led to salvation. Now, there is a passage which teaches that sorrow doesn't save, and, it's, uh, and that it's repentance that saves. That's in Acts chapter 20, verse 21. Um, testifying both to the Jews. This is uh, Paul uh, speaking to the Ephesian elders, testifying both to the Jews and uh, also to the Greeks. Repentance toward God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. Now you say, well, uh, you know, there you have two different things. Well, in a sense, in a sense, but let's look at the relationship. Repentance toward God means that a person is now taking a different viewpoint of God and his revelation and his salvation and his Messiah, and that's reflected in a dependence upon Jesus Christ. So what does all this mean? Well, repentance in the metanaeo sense is a change of mind and attitude towards God and Christ that results in a change of life direction, which may be defined as conversion. Conversion. And it results in a new dependence, which is faith in Christ. Let me give you an illustration that may uh, help to bear this out. Let's suppose that you're driving down the highway, and I'll use a local illustration uh, here. Let's say you're on I-65, and uh, you think that you're going to Louisville, Kentucky, uh, from, uh, you know, from the Campbellsville area. Uh, let's say you uh, connect with I-65 over in E-Town and you think you're, you're headed toward Louisville. But as you watch the signs, you notice to your consternation that you're getting closer and closer to Nashville, Nashville and you're getting further and further away from Louisville. Uh, now you think that you're going toward Louisville uh, and you're very in, uh, sincere in your intent to go toward Louisville, but as a matter of fact, you find yourself going in the opposite direction. What do you have to do? Well, all right, let's say you pull over to the side of the road and you stop and you check your GPS and you take a look at it very carefully and you finally realize 
that you're going in the wrong direction. And so you change your mind about the direction you're going. You make a conscious decision to turn around. That's repentance. You thought you were going in the right direction, but now you realize you aren't, so that you change your mind. You redirect your thinking. You make the decision to turn around. That's repentance. All right, you start up your car. You get to the next turn around, and you actually make the turn to, to go the other way. That's what the Bible would speak of as conversion. You've actually turned around. And then you head in a new direction with absolute confidence that you are now on your way towards Louisville. And that's faith. That's faith. You say, well, it's a three-step process. Well, in a sense, uh, it is. But in a sense, it isn't. It's really all one thing. Uh, or think of it this way. How could you possibly be an unbeliever and think of Jesus as being a good man, a great teacher, a great example, and so on, and then come... To and then come to believe on him as your Lord and Savior without changing your mind. You can't. It's really just the other side of the same coin. Repentance and conversion are simply an integral part of what it means to believe or to have faith. So, as I say, it's, it's impossible to believe on Jesus Christ in the biblical sense without changing your mind, because if you didn't have to change your mind, you would already have believed in him. So, by the very fact that you now have to trust in Christ and believe in him, this implies automatically that you are changing your thinking, you're changing your whole outlook, because previously you did not believe in him and you did not regard him as the Son of God, the Savior of the world, and your Lord. Therefore, repentance and faith are two parts of the same thing. They are two different aspects, two different ways of looking at the same transaction, and therefore, it's no wonder that they're used interchangeably in the New Testament. When Peter said, repent, and Paul said, believe, they were saying essentially the same thing, and we have to come to that conclusion, or we would have to assume that the biblical apostles were contradicting one another. And I think this, of course, is absolutely untenable. Now, I think we have some additional proof that repentance and faith are essentially interchangeable concepts. Will you consider, for example, the fact that John the Baptist is preaching in Matthew 3, verse 2, repent for the kingdom of heaven is a hand. I mean, that's John's message. We've already studied this. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And yet in John 1, 7, John says that John the Baptist came for a witness that all men might believe. Now, how would that make sense unless belief and repentance are essentially the same thing? Or consider this fact. The Gospel of John is written in order that men might be saved. And in John chapter 20 and verse 31, John specifically says this. These things are written in order that you may believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. So if there was ever a book in the Bible written specifically to produce saving faith on the part of the reader, it's the Gospel of John by specific statement. And yet, the word metanaeo, either in its noun or verb form, does not even appear in the Gospel of John. Nowhere in the Gospel of John is anyone said to repent. Nowhere is anyone urged or instructed to repent. So what do we gather from that? Well, obviously, repentance is caught up in the concept of belief. When Jesus said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes on him Obviously, he was including in that the concept of a change of mind, repentance as well. Otherwise, we would have to say that John has a totally different means of salvation from Paul and Peter. And this, of course, is nonsense. So I think we're going to have to stop there for today. We'll come back to this and finish this uh, off. Uh, I am so glad that you've joined in with us today. Um, as we have been continuing to study of Jesus, we're getting close to the end of this uh, study. I think we still have something like four uh, sessions at least. But uh, I'm glad you have decided to turn in today. Um, let me just close by saying this. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Place your trust in him. You'll be glad you did. Jesus never disappoints. 
Until next time, you take care and God bless. Bye now.